Welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast, your monthly source for conversations and curated content to improve your law practice with your host, Rocky Deer. Hi, and welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast. Are you a student of history? I, for one, love learning about history, the people, the circumstances, the circular nature of the mistakes that our species has made over time. One thing I learned along the way, though, is that some of our greatest leadership moments have been bred in crises. George Washington crossing the Potomac, Abe Lincoln in the Civil War, FDR in World War II. There's George W. Bush and his iconic bullhorn moment in the days following the tragic 9-11 attacks. These are just a few examples, but rarely do we remember leadership born of tranquility. Sorry, Calvin Coolidge. I think it's safe to say that leadership is tested when the chips are down. And as we speak, the chips are not just down, they're locked away. We're in the midst of a global pandemic, nationwide protests, and lawyers facing a daunting legal market in the midst of the economic turmoil surrounding all of that. Brittany Harrison has stepped up to all these challenges and taken on the mantle of leadership June 26, 2020, the second day of the State Bar Annual Meeting On Demand. Brittany was sworn in as president of TYLA. That's the Texas Young Lawyers Association. She is the first TYLA president to be sworn in remotely in the midst of a pandemic lockdown. That will undoubtedly be only the first of many firsts for President Harrison. Brittany graduated from UT Law and practices family law in Dallas. And let's find out what we can about looking forward to this coming year from our new TYLA president. Brittany, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Absolutely. So let's see, as, as we do this, you're now in, in week two, I think, of your presidency. How's it been so far? I don't even know what day it is at this point. We've been <laughs> <laughs> really, really busy because um, as everyone knows, TYLA puts out a lot of projects and initiatives. And so we've just been in planning mode, ready to go. You just mentioned TYLA's projects. Can you talk about what some of those are for, for the uninitiated or, or say the, the old folks like me who, who may have lost touch? Yeah. So TYLA is the public service arm of the State Bar of Texas. And so what we like to do is put out programs that are for young lawyers, resources for young mm -hmm. lawyers, also a lot of service projects. So anything that's going to teach the public about administration of justice, the rule of law, just learning about the legal system in general. So we have a lot of law-focused educational programs that teachers can use while they're teaching, which we're trying to make a lot more virtually now. So, because we don't know what's going to happen in the, in the fall. So we want to make sure we're still be able to get the message to the students. We just don't know what that format's going to be just yet. And, you know, speaking of this, this unprecedented time, I, I do want to take a moment to give a shout out to your immediate predecessor, Victor Flores, who had to navigate the very beginning of this whole pandemic challenge. So, you know, Victor, if you're listening, we all love you for what you did. But do you think the role of TYLA president has maybe changed or evolved because of this situation? And if so, how? I think it has evolved. But um, real quick, I do want to say Victor led or basically he gave me a very good example of how to go through this. So I'm very fortunate to have had uh, to, to have followed his leadership. It's just one of those things that they always tell you that the bar year you plan is not the bar you get. Right. That's definitely what's happened right now. And so <laughs> you basically just have to continue what the mission is of TYLA, but just work with what we have and do the best we can in the situation we're in, but just keeping focused on what our goal and what our mission is. So let's let's talk for a second about maybe your platform. Let's maybe compare and contrast. What was a platform you ran on and what's the platform today now that you've taken office and everything presumably has changed from the time when you ran? Or I guess, first of all, really, I guess the fundamental question is, has it changed? And if so, then how has it changed? So when I ran back in 2019, my goals were empowerment, innovation, and education. Those are still the three goals that I have for this year. Okay. The innovation portion has definitely had to step it up a little bit more just because the way right. our board works is we generally have four board meetings where we get to get together as a board. We can't do that anymore. All the in-person, all the bonding and things like that that kind of help our board run, we're not sure. able to do those things. Everyone still just has the idea of helping the public and helping people out just in general. And so we're just having to do that in a different format. And I think that's what's helping us continue to do the work is because we still have the same mission. We just have to do it from a computer screen. You said there's innovation we talked about. There's empowering. And then what was the third part? Education. Education. All right. Now, obviously, education is now going to be done online. And a lot of us with children understand what that entails. Let's talk about empowerment. Do you think the empowerment portion of it 
has shifted or has that changed now that now that we're not in person anymore is it do we have new tools available to us now that maybe allow us to to feel empowered more than we did earlier or have we taken a step back talk about empowerment for a second in the midst of what we're facing now i think because we are having to do things remotely we're actually able to reach more people so when we were doing our like roadshows, TYLA roadshows, we usually target those for certain geographic areas. And mm -hmm. only those are the ones that are really getting to benefit from those. But now because we're doing this remotely, we're able to reach a lot of people without having to travel. And then we're being able to get people that, you know, maybe out the far parts of West Texas that it's kind of hard to get out to when mm -hmm. in person, we're able to reach some of those people that are out there and get them involved in what we've been doing in some of the bigger cities. And so I think that we're still empowering people, but we're still giving more people opportunities to be empowered and become our future leaders. And so, cause I, right. everything I do, I wanna figure out, okay, for young lawyers, how can we give them opportunities to speak about issues in their communities, kind of in their local affiliates and reach out to the greater state in general. And so that's kind of what we've been able to do this time through Zoom and Teams and all those other kind of video conferencing platforms. So the Zoom and the Teams, that's that's helping you with reaching out to other TYLA members. But how how does the membership engage with communities that many of which are underserved? They may not have steady internet connections. They may not have access to Zoom or Teams. How does that change in a pandemic situation like this? So that part, we're still kind of evolving of what we're going to sure. be able to do. You know, in the past, before we had, you know, well, I shouldn't say before the internet, but before <laughs> you know, internet was a little bit more prevalent in schools, a lot of things were made on right. videos, like DVDs, things like that. Mm -hmm. So we may have to explore kind of going old school on certain things. Like, if Do they even make DVDs anymore? I, I, <laughs> I've not been able to go to Best Buy in a while. And I think Circuit City is not around. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm thinking some people that may not have the access to certain internet, they may still have some older technology in their, in their houses. And so mm. we can put like one of our programs, our iconic women in legal history, we're planning sure. to roll that out to be an interactive website. But if we have to have some of those materials on hard forms or like DVDs or something like that, we need to be able to have that flexibility and just see what's easiest for students. Let's talk about iconic women in legal history, because you just, you just talked about that. And I know you've talked about it, not only during your campaign, but even, even once you took office. Talk about that project for a second and tell us tell us what it aims to do, what's it about, and how does it really reach, say, the non-legal community, if you will? Yes. Yeah, so I got the idea from the program with talking with our law-focused education program through the State Bar of Texas. They conduct surveys and you know conferences with teachers around the state, and they're always asking what parts of things that are on the STAR test do y'all not really have resources to teach about or you don't have mm. time to teach about? And what we were learning is part of the 11th grade curriculum, it talks about women's roles in history, especially within legal rights, civil rights. That mm -hmm. story is often either rushed or completely disregarded for students. Right. And so they're it's not- like Susan B. Anthony and then move on, right? It's- Essentially, you know. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, we talk a lot about women's suffrage. That's wonderful. I'm a benefit of that. But in 1920, a black woman didn't have the same rights that a Caucasian woman had. And so there's a continued history that is often left out and just not talked about. And so what we're focusing on is this basically from suffrage going forward, what was the path and the role of women and providing a resource that can just a teacher could just turn on the internet, click on our website and learn all these, or the students can learn all these different pieces of history that are obviously on the test, but also just for their personal knowledge. And, you know, I think people even outside of high school students will be able to benefit from learning about this history because frankly, I don't remember learning it when I was in high school. And so I mm -hmm. think, you know, I'm always a proponent of everyone can continue learning throughout life. And so, yes, it's aimed towards students, but anyone studying to become a U.S. citizen or just generally people that enjoy history could learn from our program. And it's a free program that'll be on the internet. Is the focus going to be on women lawyers or is it about women's roles in advancing the rule of law or is it something entirely different? It's it's kind of a combination of both. So there are some, okay. some you know, famous lawyers that you know, we can talk about, but there's also just other women that helped get civil rights, helped, you know, with get some of the rights that we have as women today. So it's going to focus on just different women, like the first Supreme Court justice, things of those natures, mm -hmm. women in Congress, you know people in Texas history. We just want to focus on those, the stories of those women and how they've helped shape our history. So not just lawyers, but just legal history in general. 
you know, it's, it's interesting that you're, that you're talking about, about history and trying to educate people on it. I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on what role you think, and, and by the way, I, I love history. So I, I asked this, you know, really from that perspective, what role do you think history plays in understanding how we navigate the present and the future? You know, cause there's some who say, look, it happened in the past, you know, people's rights were abridged and, and abrogated in, in generations past, but that's not us today. And so why do we need to learn that? What would your answer be? Why is history important for today's environment? couple reasons um, to make sure we're not repeating the history or going backwards in times, because, you know, just because, yes, things happened in the past and over oh, different now, it's kind of shaped into a different format, but it still has the same issues. We're still having issues with racism and it's 2020. I mean, I've personally experienced racism and it's 2020. So things that happened to my ancestors are still happening in present day. And we need to learn from the mistakes of the past to move forward in the present and be able to actually move forward and not repeat the same mistakes that have been happening for so long. Being with TYLA, obviously you're, you're coming at it from the perspective of the younger lawyers, which again, like I said, I, I no longer qualify. I I'm, I'm not part of that cohort, but what do you think young lawyers and even lawyers at large can do to navigate, you know, all the challenges that, that we're hearing about in, in 2020. So between 2020 and 2021 during your presidency, what can we do as lawyers? And what do you think your cohorts as young lawyers can do during these times? I think as lawyers, we have a responsibility and we actually have kind of a privilege to effectuate change. You know, we can educate the public about what the law is, what it should be turned into and things like that. And so I think as lawyers, we can educate people and also educate ourselves because there's a lot, you know, starting conversations that are difficult, uncomfortable, especially about racism. That's a hard conversation for a lot of people. But I think the tides have kind of turned a little bit and more people want to actually take action. And I think as young lawyers, we can get that information out there as well as get out that action item, because that's kind of how a lot of lawyers works. Give me an action item so I can you know, check this off my list. And so right. I think that's what we're trying to do. In your interview for the July, August issue of the Texas Bar Journal, you tell the story of, and I'm going to quote, you have a voice. Mm-hmm. Now, I'd like to hear that story in your voice. So can you tell that story? Sure. I think it was probably my fourth or fifth year of practice. And I had just switched over, I guess fourth year, I had just switched over to family law from being a commercial litigator and employment lawyer. And I was at a firm where I didn't feel like I really had a voice and I was kind of just buried and wasn't able to really thrive. And so I was getting ready for my first trial, again, fourth year, first trial, and I'm supposed to be a litigator, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I was right. getting ready for that first trial. And I was working with John Barrett. He was a Austin I call him an Austin legend. He was, I mean, he's amazing. He's a, he's a great trial lawyer and he worked with my firm very often. And so he was great on the custody side. My firm was known more for the property. And so we worked really well together. And so I was working with him and I was just really, really nervous about putting on my very first witness. So I was like, I'm a perfectionist. You know, I want to make sure I do everything mm-hmm. right. I don't, you know, get objections, things like that. And <laughs> he was just telling me, he's just like, just remember you have a voice. And then he said, ask a question like you deserve an answer. But the you have a voice part just really stood out to me. It made me think, it's like, yes, I actually do have a voice. I am good at what I do and I need to be able to use my voice. And so it kind of was a little confidence builder for me. And I wrote it down on a post-it note. I actually kept that post-it note for about two years until all the stickiness fell off of it. Right. But of I would, for any big trial or big hearing where I was super nervous, I would always just write that down and keep it in my trial notebook. And just looking at those words, it kind of just gave me that little boost of confidence. And so what I took from that is I'm like, if I could benefit from just those four little words, so many other young lawyers can benefit from that. And even when I like to, you know, do career day things at elementary schools, I talk about the you have a voice story because I'm like the earlier children know that they do have a voice and they do matter. I think that boosts their confidence. So I like to carry that with everyone. Can you talk for a second about what, how exactly the concept of you have a voice, how did that affect your trial preparation or the way you put on the witness? I'm trying to get inside your head in a sense and understand what that did in, in, terms, of, in terms of how you approach the case or how you approach the witness and the whole litigation process. It changed the way I, like my 
the manner in which I asked questions and just okay. vi- like you could visibly see that I was more confident and you could hear in my voice that I was confident in asking my questions. I did deserve an answer to my questions because before mm. that I was more timid and just kind of asking it kind of sounding apologetic about it when gotcha. You know, <laughs> We've all been like, there. <laughs> no, you don't need to be. You need to just ask this question. It's a tough question, but this witness needs to answer the question and you deserve to have an answer. And so I think it just it more just changed my mindset and gave me the confidence and it helped me through that trial, just remembering that little bit. You weren't afraid to to ask something uncomfortable. Exactly. Okay. I like that. Well that is all the time we have for now. You know, Brittany, thank you for being here. I want to thank our TYLA president, Brittany Harrison, for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And of course, I want to thank you for tuning in. And before we sign off, I want to remind you to please stay safe and make sure to follow all applicable orders for dealing with COVID-19. And please advise your clients and loved ones to do the same. This situation is ever-changing. It is fluid and quickly evolving. So please seek out legal counsel if you have a question. If you like what you heard today, please rate and review us in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. And until next time, remember, life's a journey, folks. I'm Rocky Deer, signing off for now. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Go to TexasBar.com slash podcasts. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Find both the State Bar of Texas and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the State Bar of Texas, Legal Talk Network, or their respective officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.